Through the first week of New Orleans Saints training camp, the potential for an explosive offense is looking promising. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Huda Nation and Huda family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that we're free and available on all podcast apps and on YouTube as well. And of course, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter. Your New Orleans Saints expert, credentialed member of the media. And of course, you can find me every day over at USA Today, Saints Wire, Tuesdays, a lot in NFL, and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked On Saints. And welcome into our second episode here on this Saturday. We've been doing live episodes early on in the afternoon following training camp with some pre recorded evening episodes to go a little bit deeper into what we're learning during the day at camp. So, an explosive day for the New Orleans Saints offense during training camp. So we're going to be speaking a little bit on that today. Are the New Orleans Saints in line to have an explosive offense in 2022? So far, things are looking promising. We're also going to take a look at the New Orleans Saints identity in 2022, which seems to be holding true to what we've seen in the past. Some key parts of the scheme we can expect to continue to see going into this year. And we've got your questions, including the wide receiver room and how it's made its entire 180 from last year. But to kick us all off, we're going to get started with an explosive, explosive New Orleans Saints offense. Now, again, the New Orleans Saints started off the day with two interceptions over on the defensive side. CJ Gardner Johnson and Bradley Roby both picking off Jameis Winston to begin the earliest session of uh, team uh, or period of team drills, 11 on 11s. They did four of those sessions today, some a little bit more run heavy than others, but one of the big moments that came from uh, the entire practice came from those 11 on 11s win. Chris Olave broke free with Marshawn Lattimore sitting down on the route, kind of playing a shallow cover two coverage there, which expects to have another safety over the top. It's the idea of cover two is that there's two deep safeties, effectively each one having the responsibility of one half of the field, but there was no safety over the top. Either a rotation didn't happen or a safety was distracted by something else coming across the middle of the field, for instance, and left Chris Olave wide open down the middle. We saw Jameis Winston have all the time that he needed to really load that one up and just unleash a deep ball 60 yards down the field. At least it was a 60 yard touchdown, but the ball easily traveled 50 or so yards through the air, it looked like to me. But the the key here is what happened with that safety. And I don't want to look at this necessarily from like talking bad about the New Orleans Saints defense side, because this is something that the New Orleans offense is going to do. It's going to put pressure on opposing defenses, whether it's their own in practice or whether it's Tampa Buccaneers on game day week two, right? It doesn't matter. This is sort of the conflict that this New Orleans Saints personnel, as they've developed it over time with Michael Thomas coming back. Jarvis Landry added, and now, of course, Chris Olave added as a rookie uh, coming in as their their top rookie in this year's class. And now you're seeing Alvin Kamara. You're seeing Mark Ingram, who looked really good in day four of camp, by the way. I don't know if that's really something that I, I've talked about in the earlier episode. Mark Ingram looked really good today. And so, you know, all of the weapons that are there and Adam Troutman, Nick Kroll, ah, I did it again, Lucas Kroll, these guys, they're all, um, you know, starting to show you what they can do as well. So what happens is that you end up stressing that opposing defense quite a bit, particularly the safeties. And that's what happened on the field on Saturday. And you can expect to see that throughout the season in 2022. What happens is that either that safety comes down for Michael Thomas running a crossing route or Jarvis Landry running a crossing route and then leaves Chris Olave wide open down the field, or that safety runs with Chris Olave, and then because he's vacated his, he's vacated a spot, you end up having an open crosser crawling up and climbing up to the second level that Marshawn Lattimore doesn't have the depth necessarily to get to. So there are all of these ways that you end up putting defenders in conflict that the New Orleans Saints are now going to be able to take advantage of at all three levels. Pretty much since 2018, let's say the latter half of 2018 going into 2019, 
you've had to take advantage of those sort of conflict defenders in the short to intermediate area, kind of within 20 yards of the line of scrimmage because the New Orleans offense became so condensed over time. Now, you don't necessarily have to worry about that. And when you have field stretchers and deep threats like Chris Olave and Deontay Hardy, you're going to be able to take advantage of those third level drop-offs that maybe you didn't get a chance to take advantage of in years past. And as this system is built with Jameis Winston in mind, as Jameis Winston has had time to get comfortable in the system and ask for and request the adjustments that he would like as well, working in concert with guys like Ronald Curry, who of course is the quarterback coach, but also passing game coordinator, who's helping to build the offense along with offensive coordinator Pete Carmichael, who will call the plays, you start getting the nuances right. And that's maybe where things could have been better for the Saints passing offense when Jameis Winston was the quarterback in 2021, even though there were a lot of things that did go right, right? You saw the big touchdowns in the Washington game and the Green Bay game, all of that. But for the most part, this was an offense that only threw the ball 25 or so times per game. Now, as you're kind of getting the nuances correct, and as everybody's getting into rhythm and everybody is getting comfortable, maybe you open that up a little bit earlier this season because you've gotten to prepare this entire team together in OTAs, mandatory minicamps, rookie minicamps before that, and training camp with no quarterback competition. You're not splitting first team reps across two different quarterbacks here. Jameis Winston is with the first team. Andy Dalton is with the second team. Ian Book is with the third team. Simple, easy, done, end of conversation. So now you're getting the reps. You're getting the chemistry. You're building the communication. You're building the cohesion. And you're finding the nuances. You're finding the little details that make sense. So if you do as Mark Ingram always suggests and look at the details, then you end up putting together what can be a very explosive offense in 2022, especially with now three level threats all over the field. We got to speak with Jarvis Landry after practice today, and he got to speak and he spoke a little bit about how Michael Thomas changes everything for this New Orleans Saints offense, how Chris Olave impacts this offense. You can hear the excitement from wide receivers about other wide receivers, even Jarvis Landry talking a bit about Kirk Merritt as well, who's coming in and, you know, he's a Destrahan kid. He's a, he's a guy here from, from the city, just like uh, Jarvis Landry is, or from the, from the area, just like Jarvis Landry is. And so you're hearing the excitement about how these guys are all going to be able to complement one another, how they're going to be able to build off of one another. And when you have a quarterback that can hit all three levels, that's specifically focusing on getting the right things right in terms of decision making, in terms of short, quick passing, all of that stuff, that's going to end up opening up the rest of that offense for you. So the compliment that you're going to see all throughout the 2022 NFL season when it comes to New Orleans Saints passing attack should allow them to be way more explosive than they had the ability to be over the past couple of years, especially in 2021. Now, that's not to say that the New Orleans Saints won't also run the ball, use six offensive linemen, or be a defensively led team. That's the identity that they have picked up over the course of the past couple of years, and it doesn't look like that's going away any time soon. I'll give you the observations that lead me to that conclusion as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. And we get to do that thanks to our friends over at Bet Online where you can get all of the odds, lines, and props more than ever before over at their website, which you can access on your mobile device or your laptop. They've got odds for 11 regular season games for the New Orleans Saints, four of which, let me make sure I get this math right, four of which they are underdogs, five of which they are favored, and there are two pickems against the Cincinnati Bengals and the Baltimore Ravens. So depending on how you feel about any of that, you can go and check out Bet Online and maybe win yourself some money this season by getting in on all of that great, fantastic sports wagering opportunities and those great and fantastic sports wagering information, podcasts, articles, all of that that you can find over at Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thank you again for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Really, really grateful to everybody who was out at practice today that took the time to say hi, got a couple of photos, got some people saying what's up, everything. I appreciate y'all. Thank you so much for all of the support here on the show. And thanks again for being here with us for our second Saturday show. It's a little bit out of the ordinary for us here on Locked on Saints. Usually we're Monday through Friday, but of course, throughout training camp, I want to make sure you have all the information that you need. And there were a couple of key observations for me today that I think say something that's maybe a little bit larger than most of the statements you're going to hear at this point throughout camp. because. Look, these guys haven't even put pads on yet, right? Like that happens on Monday 
And then that's really where you get to do things like evaluate the offensive line and talk. And then we'll be able to discuss how far has Cesar Ruiz come along? How far has Trevor Penning come along? How's, how are the linebackers looking? Who's the you know defensive linemen that are standing out? All of that. We get a little bit more evaluation of the run game and the trenches and the second level of the defense and all that once the pads go on. So it's still early here. But one thing that I can say for sure is that the New Orleans Saints have done a very, very good job keeping intact their identity, even with all of the personnel changes that have happened over the course of this offseason. And really over the course of the last two seasons, right? This team lost a Hall of Fame or future Hall of Fame quarterback, a future Hall of Fame head coach as well in back-to-back seasons, right? With Drew Brees retiring, with Sean Payton stepping away from football for at least a year. That is enough, and we've seen just one of those things create absolute turmoil in a, uh, in, a, in a franchise, right? In an organization. I mean, just look at the Atlanta Falcons right now and what happened to them when Matt Ryan left over the course, course of this offseason. In shambles. So when you look at where the Saints are here, it's really impressive that they came out of that and had what I think is fair to call a successful offseason, right? All of the additions that they brought in, like Tyron Matthew and Jarvis Landry and, you know, bringing in local guys like Kirk Merritt and um, Dejon Dixon, a great draft, bringing in guys like Marcus May and Justin Evans. I mean, all the work that they have done over the course of this offseason, re-signing Jameis Winston, all that. I would call it a successful offseason. And a lot of teams would be in shambles right now. Again, like those Atlanta Falcons that we just kind of mentioned. But what I am really excited to see and am, am, I guess, impressed to see is that not only did they survive the offseason in terms of having a successful one, they brought in all of these new faces. They made all of these changes. They made shifts in their coaching staff, all of that. And the identity of this team is still intact. They feel very much like a defense first team, right? The most vocal players that are out there on a day-to-day basis at training camp are guys like Demario Davis, uh, Justin Evans, CJ Gardner-Johnson, Smoke Monday, and of course, Cam Jordan. That's the identity of your team right now. Now, Jameis, of course, is very vocal. Mark Ingram, of course, is very vocal. They have those guys on the offensive side too. But there's something about the way that the defense conducts itself, dare I call it swagger, as much as I hate using that word now. Um, but they have that, right? They have the attitude. They have the the charisma. They have the, uh, what's the thing you're always looking for in like video games and all that? I guess it is charisma, right? But you have all of that stuff that allows you to be, <laughs> my nerd came out there, I almost made a D&D reference. Uh, <laughs> you really have the ability to see all that. And that identity goes beyond just what the defensive identity is. This is a team that has been focusing big time on the run game, right? Doing a lot of run prep in terms of their install, right? It's mostly their install, but still, you're seeing a lot of work in the run game. You're seeing a lot of work for the trenches. You're seeing a lot of work in the offensive and defensive line, all that. That's the identity. What did the New Orleans Saints always, always, what have they always talked about in the past since 2006, right? You want to be a run first team. That focuses on stopping the run and that wins games in the trenches. That's what they've always talked about. That identity is still very much here. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is that we know that Taysom Hill is expected to still get snaps at quarterback in 2022, mostly probably some short short yardage uh, QB power type situations. So the extra piece of that is, of course, in those, in those reps where uh, Taysom comes in and is under center, but also other reps in the run game and those short yardage uh, elements, Sean Payton in the past has really utilized six offensive linemen on the field, right? Like there's always those situations where you've got two tight ends, a sixth offensive lineman, one wide receiver or something like that, along with your, um, your running back or, you know, an extra offensive lineman in place of a wide receiver. So you've got two wide receivers, a tight end, an offensive lineman, and then your running back. And the purpose of that is kind of those jumbo sets, as they're often called. Sometimes that player would be referred to as a swing tackle, tackle eligible, or a jumbo tight end, or or all the different phrases you would use. But it all means relatively the same thing, that there's an extra or sixth offensive lineman out there to help just give some more bulk on the offensive line, particularly in those short area situations. I spoke with Landon Young today when he you know, came out for media. Unfortunately, my phone was dead by that time. I was tweeting too much during, <laughs> during the open practice. But um, he spoke about, or I asked him about that six offensive line spot. And if that's something that this offensive line room takes into consideration when it comes to competing for snaps. 
Like, is competing for the starting role the only way that you look at it and then you luck into the sixth offensive line responsibility? Or do people calculate the idea that, hey, I could be one of these five or even if I just end up being the sixth guy, I can still get out on the field and I still get to, you know, be a mean man on the football field. And Landon Young mentioned that it's absolutely something that they take into consideration and that players take pride in. He mentioned that if you're not playing one of the tackle positions as a starter, you're expected to basically know both sides. Right now, Landon Turner is learning a lot, excuse me, Landon Young is learning a lot of the right tackle spot right now, but he already knows how to play left tackle. He did it at Kentucky against SEC pass rushers, i.e. NFL pass rushers. So they're really having him focus on right tackle. Zach Streif, of course, who's played that position before, is back with the organization. He played right tackle in this system, and he's the assistant offensive line coach. So he's working really closely with Landon Young, all of that. And then I asked, just out of curiosity, do you expect that you're still going to see as many sixth offensive line snaps in 2022 as you've seen in the recent past? And he said, look, can't really explain or say what it's going to be, but he did mention that it's still in the playbook and that it's still something that they consider and something that they still work on. So I would expect to see it. So when it comes to just being the biggest, meanest group out on the field, The New Orleans Saints still have the identity of the New Orleans Saints from last year, a defensive team that wants to be able to effectively run the ball and that has certain levels of its identity in terms of its scheme or elements of its scheme, like the six offensive line sets that you should expect to see going into 2022 that won't change despite the fact that there's going to be new personnel all around. A lot of that new personnel has found its way over to the wide receiver room In particular, what is it that we can attribute to that big 180 that this New Orleans Saints wide receiver room has taken? We're getting to your questions next as we wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints with your questions from the live episode earlier today. Let's dive right into it. We're going to get to Kyle Brister who asked, Is it safe to say that the wide receiver position, which was our biggest weakness last year, may be the Saints' second biggest strength this year? Interesting. I'm curious about what the first biggest, first biggest, what the biggest strength is to Kyle. I imagine maybe the secondary might be the one, but I will say this. Yes, the New Orleans Saints wide receiver room has taken a massive turnaround. Remember last year, the highest drafted player that the Saints put out on the field in 2022 was Kevin White, which was a highly drafted wide receiver, but he didn't really have the production of a top 10 selection, right? He didn't have the snaps of a first round selection. Really, your highest and most experienced, highest drafted and most experienced wide receiver in the room was Traquan Smith, and the other guys that were the most massive contributors behind him were undrafted, Deontay Hardy and Marquez Calloway. Now, you've got Jarvis Landry. You've got a first round pick that you just invested in Chris Olave. You've got Michael Thomas back in the building, who was shockingly a second round pick. The list of wide receivers drafted ahead of Michael Thomas in 2016 is comical, absolutely comical, including Laquan Treadwell. Word. So when you look at where the wide receiver room is now, that includes those three players, but also the guys that contributed heavily from last year, like Deontay Hardy and Marquez Calloway. Traquan Smith has been in the system for a while. Then you have some other talented guys back there that you shouldn't sleep on. Aesop Winston, for instance, who is another field-stretching deep threat that can bring some special teams value as a returner. Dejon Dixon, the undrafted free agent out of Nickel State. The, um, uh, Kirk Merritt, the, another local guy that has NFL experience and actually really has looked good so far throughout camp. Maybe a, I think Jeff Duncan tweeted out that he was like, I can't beast candidate for right now. So yeah, this wide receiver room has had a humongous turnaround since 2021 and is easily their second, if not their biggest strength going into this next season. Next up, we got the Youngblood 46. Evening, Ross. Evening. (laughs) What receivers at the bottom of the depth chart do you think have a chance to make the roster? So let's let's go back to that. Dejan Dixon, definitely one of them. Kirk Merritt, definitely one of them. Those would be the two that I would I would highlight. Aesop Winston, actually, there you go, three to highlight. Kawan Baker, who the Saints drafted a couple of years ago, has had some nice moments as well. The biggest thing is going to be, can he contribute in special teams? That, that's going to be the biggest thing. I, I see Kawan Baker as a little bit more of a practice squad guy than challenging for the roster. The other question mark is how many wide receivers either are the Saints going to keep or are they willing to keep? Because here's the thing. 
we could sit here and say all day long, oh, well, the Saints are going to keep five wide receivers because that's their usual rhythm. Oh, no, the Saints are going to keep six wide receivers because there's so much talent. Both of those things can be right. You just have to be the receiver that gives them no choice, right? There's the option of keeping five wide receivers because that's what you want for your team. But if you're a receiver that does enough and you, may, and you give the Saints no choice but to keep you, they're not going to be mad about that at all. I'm curious about whether or not fullback is going to be as much of a position or a used, utilized position in this offense as it's been in the past. Adam Prentice is the only fullback in camp. He's looked good, made a couple of even older over-the-shoulder catches, has looked good as a lead blocker as well. Does a good job with that. Malcolm Brown mentioning that one of the reasons why he came to New Orleans is because they utilize a fullback. He loves that slash run concept, which the Saints run. But if the fullback isn't taking up a roster spot or that's not a, a route that this team believes its future is in and they go the, the, the route of maybe the rest of the NFL without having fullbacks, which please don't, I love fullback, then that makes up, a room, that makes up room for another, another wide receiver. So those would be the three guys that I would highlight, but two of those guys could make the roster. One of those guys could make the roster. It, it all depends. So it, all is not lost for any of these guys just because it's easy to pick out a top five when it comes to these wide receivers. Traquan Smith and those guys would be in competition, I believe, for a fifth or a sixth spot. So they would be the names that I would say that are worth watching. Connected to that, Ryan McGee asked about Dejon Dixon. We talked about him now, but also asked about if there were any uh, highlights for a guy like Abram Smith. Uh, and I believe it was Robert Kraus also asked about Abram Smith. Listen, Abram Smith has had some nice moments. I think that he moves really, really well. He's, he, his, his movement is a little bit smoother than guys like Tony Jones Jr. Tony Jones had a couple of drops in. Friday's practice and all which make you a little bit nervous maybe about how his standing is with the team right now but he had a pretty nice day out here on Saturday but Abram Smith moves a lot smoother than him um he moves a lot I I think he I think he moves a lot smoother than a guy like Dwayne Washington as well it's just going to be can he also contribute on special teams can he do the extra stuff I still say that the other standout running back behind Alvin Kamara and Marcus Mark Ingram so far has been Divine Azigbo he's just made more plays but I thought Abram Smith had a nice practice on Saturday in particular, which is good. Because remember, and actually, no, I can't say remember, we haven't talked about it yet. I've written about it, but I haven't talked about it. This part of practice, this part of training camp is usually guys with NFL experience look really good. And there's a gap between them and the young guys like Abram Smith. But once they start to get their footing, the younger guys, the UDFAs, the rookies, that gap starts to close. So even though Abram Smith hasn't had any really big standout moments up until today, it doesn't mean that he won't have them moving forward. You just have to wait for that gap to close a little bit. Once these younger guys start to get their feet under them, that's when that starts to happen. And pads coming on usually equalizes a lot of people too. Barbara Williams wants to know, um, she, she asked, we know that the D-line and the secondary is top shelf, Shaka Bra, uh, with Quan Alexander, now a Jet, what do you think of the linebacking core? I like this linebacking core. And I think that there are five linebackers on this team right now that I would say can and likely will make the roster. I might even push that to six. Demario Davis, Pete Werner, definitely up at the top of that. Eric Wilson, number 58. He's another one that I, I would watch. He's got NFL experience. He would kind of be your second oldest linebacker in the room, second most experienced linebacker in the room. There's value there. And he can play multiple positions. And he's looked good particularly in run fits. Um, I would put Andrew Dowell in that conversation, Caden Ellis in that conversation, and DeMarco Jackson in that conversation as well. Zach Bond for me is kind of an odd man out right now, although he has been getting snaps and he hasn't looked bad at all. And he's a special teams contributor, but you're still trying to morph him into something that he's never been before, right? He's never been asked to be an off-ball linebacker. He's usually been a pass rusher. I think there's good trade fodder there for an elite position. And a guy that could be a speed edge rusher, which a lot of other teams, not necessarily the New Orleans Saints, but a lot of other teams value. The Saints like their power rushers, that there could be something there in terms of roster cuts where Zach Bond gets moved. But we'll see how that goes, right? If Zach Bond does enough to prove that he can be an off-ball linebacker, then he challenges with a guy like, let's say, Andrew Dowell, for instance. So those are the ones that I would say. But I like where the New Orleans Saints linebacker room is. I don't think that they're going to suffer without Quan Alexander, especially because Quan would have been a backup anyway if he was signed with the team he would have fallen behind Pete Werner regardless, which might be one of the reasons why he's not on the team at this point. And we'll wrap up now with Daniel Laurent, who said, Ross, you mentioned last season about Taysom being really good in terms of his short-term memory, in terms of not uh, letting previous possessions affect his game. Is that something going on with Jameis going into this season as well? I think Jameis showed you today that he can be that guy. 
he opens up practice with two back-to-back interceptions, one of which would have been a pick six. Not a great start, especially with fans out there kind of cheering and jeering based upon that as well. You have a mix of people who really believe in Jameis and a mix of people that don't necessarily believe in Jameis. A lot of pressure. And I, don't, I'm, I mean that from like the fan base perspective as well as like the national perspective. In the organization, they believe in Jameis. It's not really a question. But I think that he showed you right after that. He comes back, he throws two more passes, including one directly to the area where the first pass was picked off and then a second one just to the left of the area where the second pass was picked off. So he went back to those areas and he went back to Chris Olave, which is who the second interception was in coverage on by Bradley Roby. So I think that speaks volumes in terms of what Jameis Winston is not impacted by, which is mistakes, which is good. It's a good thing. And then you saw the big 60-yard touchdown, all the highlights floating all around there, Mike Triplett, Luke Johnson, and others, and, and even the New Orleans Saints official Twitter tweeting all of that out if you haven't seen it yet. So I would say, yes, it, it is something that I have already observed in Jameis that I think will be good for him going into 2022. This idea that Jameis gonna, is going to come in and throw like, you know, eight interceptions in a season just isn't true. Like that doesn't happen when you play high variance football. So you have to be prepared to turn the ball over because you're attacking deep, you're, you're being more aggressive, things like that. That's okay. As long as you're not throwing 25 interceptions in a season or anything like that, you're in a good place. And sometimes you look at the pass with Drew Brees, you can do that <laughs> and still bring a team to the playoffs. So it's not the end of the world. It's what you do next, right? It's not what you do wrong. It's what you do next. And I think Jameis Winston has shown you he has a propensity to do the right thing next, even when he does something wrong to get it started. All right, y'all. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to be joined by Boot Crew Media's Jack Collada. I'm so excited to talk with Jack. He and I have had a blast so far during camp. So we're going to bring you everything that we have seen during the first week of camp and what we're looking forward to going into the second week of camp, especially with pads coming on starting on Monday. So we're going to break all of that down for you on Uh, It'll be a Monday episode, but I'll drop it on Sunday so you still get something every single day. And then, of course, Monday through the rest of the week, we're back to our usual rhythm of a uh, live stream and then a pre-recorded episode later on in the evening. And we'll do that same rhythm each and every week. So I appreciate y'all, as always, for being here with us. We're making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day for your second listen. Make sure you go and check out the Locked on NFL podcast. I appreciate y'all as always making you a part of your routine. If you see me, say hi. I will see y'all tomorrow. But for everything else you need in between these episodes on your New Orleans Saints, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you that nation. I'll holla at you.